Good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here. Hope everybody's staying warm. Let's stand together and let's sing a glorious day. Good morning, church family. You guys can have a seat. We are glad you guys are with us. Thank you for making it out on a beautifully cold Sunday morning. And hey, we're glad you're here. I need to make you aware of just something for, uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, we will not have the Sunday night 5 o'clock study right? just because of the possible snow. And I don't know what it is. Maybe because we've said we're doing this sermon series on the windows. We've been praying for sunlight for every Sunday. Maybe the sun is kind of pushing off that, that snow that we might, might get or not. I don't know. But we will not have tonight's uh, uh, 
uh, Bible study at 5 o'clock. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Hey, we're glad you guys are with us. This is the second Sunday of the month. And throughout 2024, we're going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be highlighting different ministry and mission partners that we have uh, through First Baptist Church on the second Sunday of every month. And this month, we're going to be highlighting Options on Main. And Options on Main, we got the director over here, Miss Deborah. You know, she's right here. After the service, they're going to be downstairs in the Fellowship Hall area right next to the fireplace area where you can see some of the, the uh, ministries that Options on Main has. But they are a, a pregnancy resource center that offers help, uh, hope, and healing to women and men who are facing an unplanned pregnancy. And what we're wanting to do this month is you see this envelope in your pew? Can you grab one of these out? Second Sunday Mission Connect. We're going to ask at everyone today, would you just give $5? We're asking you to give $5 because here's what we're hoping we can help Options on Main do. They need car seats for them, some of the clients they're working with. And we think we can be able to raise some money today and be able to purchase some car seats that they can be able to help use that with some of the clients. Now, some of you probably didn't have cash, but there is a QR code. Huh, yeah, yeah, you know, we get a little QR codes out now. So you might be able to give it digitally along those lines. But here's what we're doing. If everyone was to just give $5, we're going to be able to help them, bless them to be able to have some car seats. Now, what they just told me last week or earlier today was they just gave out their last car seat. And this is a great opportunity that we can be able to help them. Now, the second thing we're wanting to do with every second Sunday is not only talk about a tangible financial need, we want to lock, lock into what is some things that we as a church can do to help them and how can we serve. And on sun, uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to have a special night of worship that Options on Main is sponsoring. It's a Sanctity of Life uh, worship service. And I have some opportunities for us as a church to serve. I need greeters on Saturday night. If you could greet, we have a sign-up sheet downstairs that you could sign up for. We're going to provide child care. If you have had a background check here at First Baptist Church and work with our children and you're available on Saturday night, we need some people to help us with child care for Saturday night. Birth through age four is what we're doing. And then also, I just want you to be able to know that Colt right here, he's going to be leading the worship on Saturday night. He needs a worship choir. And if you would like to participate in the worship choir, you can sign up down there by the fireplace. And these are just some tangible ways that we can give to make it meet a financial need for uh, options on Main, but also serve to be able to make a real impact for our community. And we're glad you're part of that. So next month is the second Sunday. We're going to highlight and celebrate what we've done today. But we're also going to highlight a new ministry mission partner next month. But we're glad you're with us in our time of worship. I want to transition with a time of prayer and continue to ask the Lord to guide us. So let's pray. Father, this is a good day today. It's cold, but it's good because you are here. And Father, we come and we gather to be able to honor you and to worship you. And so through the different elements that have been planned, through the music, through the spoken word, would you just use those to help direct and point and put our attention on your son, Jesus? Because that's what it's about. And that's why we're here, to worship. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you all please stand as we continue worship? Hey, let's come to hey. 
place when the heart is under fire.
just want to speak the name of Jesus. Open every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus.
and shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus so good to us. Let's bow our heads and pray with one another. Lord, as we come on this this cold day, Lord, we have come into your house being warmed by your spirit, Lord, that you have visited us as we sing, as we lift in your name, as we speak and sing your name, Lord. There is no other name by which we are saved. There is no other name with power, with holiness, with righteousness behind it, other than the name of Jesus. Lord, It's such a privilege to be able to sing it and proclaim your name in this room. Lord, and as we we sing about your name and there's beautiful melodies sung, Lord, the greatest thing of all is we get to hear about your name in the word, Lord, is how you have come, how you are described by the many writers. Lord, you are holy and great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sending your spirit to be among us. At this time, I lift up Rodney as he comes, Lord. Would you bless him as he leads us? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks, Cole. Thank you so much. Well, I'll greet you the same way I greeted the first service. Good morning, penguins and polar bears. So so good to see you. Glad glad you're here. We're going to look at this, uh, if you'll pardon me from pointing, the picture of Moses here, and I'm going to, again, uh, spend time on the panel, really not talk about uh, other symbols that we'll bring up uh, later as we look at other windows. I want to read from the 78th Psalm, and you might go ahead and turn there because we're going to look together uh, at a few more verses in this Psalm. It seems to capture, in certain respects, um, at least the optimism of that picture that in the first few verses of verses 1 through 7, um, so if, as you turn there, please listen. As a matter of fact, that's the first word of the psalmist. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. The word there is Torah, law, instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children. But tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God. Not forget the works of God. Keep his commandments. And then he goes on to talk about and not be stubborn like their fathers. There's several um, images, several uh, expressions of the story of God giving the law to Moses. And I hear dissonance in this picture, much like the one we looked at last week, Christ knocking at the door. In certain respects, uh, this panel of Moses isn't quite what I would have expected. 
First of all, of course, when you look at the picture, and by the way, um, I've noticed, you know, most of you uh, have uh, gone to your assigned seats. That's good, good, good to see that. And isn't it interesting how, we're, we're interesting creatures, aren't we? You'd think we've assigned those seats to you. As a matter of fact, one of the ways we could get you maybe not to sit there is, is to assign it. You have to sit there, so then we'd prove, no, wait a minute, you can't tell me where to sit. As a matter of fact, I'm about to get really dangerous now and, and upset the Baptist tradition apple cart uh, because if you can't see the window, um, well, I'm sorry. Most of you probably can. It's a pretty good window. We're going to look at the, the far window in the back next week. So you might think about positioning yourself. I know this is a radical idea. I mean, I, we were, I was musing this week, wouldn't it have been great if we didn't have pews? We had individual seats, and I could just, we could set them up in a concave, you know, a semicircle, so we'd all be facing the window. But I know that's a dangerous thing. I'd probably lose my job if we tried that, telling you where to sit. But you might just, just be radical and, and, and try to position yourself in a way that you might be able to see um, the window, I know those coveted seats in the balcony, they're just so desirable, and even under the balcony, come f- into the light, brothers and sisters. <laughs> we, we beckon you. The first thing I see, and I'm sure your eye falls there, um, is what Moses is carrying, because he's most identified with this, and your eye probably goes to it, and what is it he's carrying? The tablets in his right hand. As a matter of fact, what's interesting about those Ten Commandments, those tablets, is that you can see the numbers and they're Roman numbers. That's really, rather than Hebrew, <laughs> they use Roman numbers. And of course, the whole thing is framed by a Greco Roman arch, and we'll talk about that and perspective later. But this is something that we so associate Moses with the law, the commandments. And yet, it's what he holds in his left hand that I find just as important. And we kind of just pass over that. Moses, as a matter of fact, this panel, uh, this window uh, in that little booklet that was published for the 150th anniversary of our church, called this Moses with the Tablets. And yet, he's not just carrying the Ten Commandments in his right arm. What does he have in his left arm? A staff. And what did he do with that staff? Do you all know? You all go good. I'm not hearing what you're saying, but I'm hearing some good comments. What, 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 a little louder? Well, part of the Red Sea, is that what I'm hearing back there? There? Okay, well, I'm sorry. I, the older I get, I can't hear anymore. I'm going to have to get one of those little trumpets. We have listening devices, by the way. I maybe start using one. Yeah, we've got them now for anyone who would like to use them. Yeah, so, okay, sorry. I'll just, I'm a, I think I heard this, and this is what I thought. God told Moses, lift your staff, and it caused the waters of the Red Sea to part. As a matter of fact, the way the psalmist will describe it here, we'll read it in a minute, heaped up waters, almost like a scene from the, you know, Charles and Heston, the Ten Commandments. Um, So there it is, uh, the staff that he used to to part the waters to bring about salvation for Israel from Egyptian slavery. What else? Do you think of another story, if I could hear you say it? Struck Struck the rock. Good, who said that? Well done. And what, why did he strike the rock? Provide water. So what's really interesting about that story is that they crossed the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, in a miraculous way. The Egyptian army drowns. They're there in the desert, and everyone knows, and Psalmist is going to ask this in a minute, you know, you, you can't live in the desert without God, uh, food and drink. And so they begin to complain that they're hungry, and then later they complain that they're thirsty, And Moses is told by God to take that staff and strike the rock, and water comes forth. So when I see Moses carrying the tablets and the staff, I think of 
the commandments of God and, and, and the way in which he provided for Israel not only escape from Egypt, but water in the desert. Or another way of putting it is, often the Old Testament, is this, the, the law is described as something that is delightful to the taste, or it's the bread that comes from heaven. So I see bread and water. And yet, although that makes a lot of sense, there's other things about this picture that doesn't quite line up for me. The dissonance begins to kick in. Um, for example, where is Israel? Where are they? I mean, Moses was the great shepherd, right? They would lead Israel from Egyptian slavery through the desert, wandering for 40 years, and into the land of promise. But where are they? Isn't it interesting? The, he's by himself. Not only is he by himself, it's not quite the way I would picture it. When you know, It's obvious he's received the law. He's got it in his hands, right? But there's no mountain. It's not like he's come from the mountain to going back to Israel. He, he's just by himself. And, and although we're told that that happened in the desert, God gave the law to a bunch of slaves in the desert, which has great significance. But that doesn't look like the desert, does it? You've got a date palm, and you've you know, got lush vegetation. And can you see the water behind him, by the way? There's a little pool of water, which I think echoes the staff. So this, this doesn't look like the desert. This looks like paradise. Not only that, you know the story when God gave the law, Moses goes up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and God gives the law. What was it like? What was the weather like that day when God gave the law? Was it bright and sunshiny and rainbows and butterflies? Tell me. It was, that's right, it was dark and cloudy and the earth shook and Israel was so frightened by the theophany that they sh shrunk away in fear. I'm glad Moses is going up there to meet that God. And so, you know, if this were a picture of the giving of the law, you would expect Israel to be following him. You see a mountain behind, and it would be dark and brooding. Very, very indeed intimidating. Not dark like that. Picture of Christ. Darkness. So, why? Why, 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 why would the artist decide to kind of throw these images that are, you hear the Old Testament, yes, and the tablets and the staff, and yet you see not a desert, not a dark, cloudy day, you see, it's almost as if the scripture above that panel kind of goes with this, a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. When the law of God comes, it's a bright, beautiful day, mid-morning. You could even say this is an idyllic picture of what the law of God was supposed to do. Right? Bring the blessing of God in a desert. To bring light to the darkness. I mean, Israel was supposed to follow the law of God that they might be a light to the Gentiles. But that's not what happened. I mean, how, how do we go from this to that? How does Israel take the law of God from Moses, and the light and beauty that it's supposed to bring them, and why did it get so dark by the time Jesus shows up? Reading again from the 78th Psalm, verse 10. In spite of the fact that God gives this law and it pass it on to generations and that they wouldn't forget the works of God, they would keep his commandments, they were stubborn, as the psalmist says. This is the story you see over and over again in the Hebrew Scriptures. Verse 10, they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. He wrought wonders before their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through, and he made the water stand up like a heap. 
Then he led them with the cloud by day and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks, here it is, in the wilderness, gave them abundant drink like the ocean depths. He brought forth streams also from the rock, caused waters to run down like rivers. And yet, they still continued to sin against him, to rebel against the Most High in the desert. In their heart, they put God to the test by asking food according to their desire. Then they spoke against God, and this is what they ask, and this is an incredibly powerful question. I hear poetic significance in this. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Can he? Behold, he struck the rock so that waters gushed out. Streams were overflowing. Can he give them bread also? Will he provide meat for his people? How is it that the law of God comes as a lamp in their feet and a light in their path that's supposed to bring life in the desert, a law that he gave to Israel to help them come into the land of promise, this law that represents the light of God's righteousness and a staff that represents his mercy where he brings forth water from a rock. How in the world does this picture of daylight turn into that darkness. Why did Israel not keep the law? Now, the psalmist attributed to us their stubbornness, something Paul will talk about as well. And I want to ask that question. Why? Why did the law not bring light and life to Israel? Why? Well, there are some Christians, especially of the Reformed tradition, that think, well, the law is impossible to keep. It can't be kept. It's a standard that no one can keep. Well, that is true perhaps for Gentiles. After all, the law was not given to us. God didn't give the law to Gentiles. He gave it to Israel. And he expected Israel to keep the law. Moses says as much in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He even anticipates, as he's given that farewell sermon before he's taken up to Mount Nebo and there he'll die, he he gets to see the land of promise only from a distance. As he delivers that sermon, he says, and don't say the law is too difficult to keep. Don't give yourself an out. It's near to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It should be in your hand. It's not too difficult to obey. Besides, Paul says the same thing. Would God give Israel a law, an impossible standard, that they couldn't keep so that they would fail, so that they would stumble and fall? Paul says in Romans 11, absolutely not. There's no way God would set them up for failure. There's no way he would give them a law that they would fail. No, God intended for Israel to keep the law. And here it is, even if you violate one of the commandments, it's not like God, you know, washes his hands and goes, oh, well, you're no longer a child of God. You you broke the commandment. No, here it is, embedded in the law, get this, embedded in the law is the mercy of God. Not only a mercy that spares you if you obey the law of God, If Israel were to obey, they would have spared themselves from self-destruction and the horrible things that sin can do, not only to themselves but to their neighbors. But embedded in the law, if you violate it, there is a safety net. You are forgiven because if you keep the law, you will offer the necessary sacrifices that God prescribes. Where? In the law. It's what Jesus talks about. In the Sermon on the Mount, when he ascends a mountain in Matthew's gospel, just like Moses, and he starts quoting Moses. You've heard Moses say, you've heard it said, don't kill. But I say to you, if you hate someone, you've violated the commandment. And as he offers the problem, why Israel fails to see that he indeed is the light of the world, that he is the bread, the manna come from heaven, 
That he is the river of living water that if you drink from it, you'll never thirst again. The reason Israel fails to keep the law, the reason they even also fail to see Jesus for who he is, is because they fail to see and to live the mercy of God. That's why the scripture above the panel is there. And by the way, let me say, just this last week, uh, I, you know, I didn't expect that scripture. If you've got Moses carrying the law, and it's supposed to be a lamp, actually that scripture should be over here, a lamp under their feet, a light under their path, because it's a beautiful sunny day. Moses is, you know, can you see him? He's, he's this confident and he's got a staff and you've got, you know, the law of God and you've got the staff which brings water. And the, I mean, this, is, this represents the justice and mercy of God in each arm. Here he goes. So I would expect the scripture to be, a, follow the law to light up your life or, or, or let it be as honeycomb to your mouth, sweet to the taste, as the psalmist says. It's the bread of heaven. It is the water of life. Or even, you know, what command? Obey the law of God or keep his commandments. Doesn't that make sense? Am I the only one? But when I see that picture, I kind of fold my arms, and if I had a beard, I'd stroke it, you know, that pensive pose. And look at it, and, you know, I'm no art critic, but I would stand back and go, no, wait a minute, this, that's not quite what happens in the Old Testament when the law comes. And that, that beautiful day just really doesn't happen. The psalmist talks about it, you know, because Israel wants to know, well, can God prepare a table in a desert? Can he provide water from a rock? Can he bring bread from heaven? Can he? And here comes Jesus who says, I'm the bread from heaven. Doesn't he? If you drink from the water I give, you'll never thirst again. Do you hear it? They said, well, Moses brought us manna from heaven. (laughs) Why can't they see The reason the day turns to night is the same reason why they couldn't see the embodiment of the law of God. They couldn't see the embodiment of mercy. Now the scripture. What? As your father. What does it say? Is merciful. Because, and honestly, when I looked, I, I thought, wow, that's an interesting, because that doesn't come from the Old Testament. You know, here we go again. We've got image and word kind of talking to one another. That's, that's from the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it comes, if you want to turn there, from Jesus' sermon. Luke calls it a sermon on the plain. It, it's probably the second time he preached it. Matthew says he preached it from a mountain from the very beginning. And, you know, like Jesus, if you've got a good sermon, you're going to repeat it. So I think this time he preaches a similar sermon on a plane, two different occasions, and he's saying much of the same thing. And where Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you've heard it said don't kill, but I say to you, don't hate. You've heard it said don't commit adultery, but I say to you, don't lust. I mean, he's showing the heart of God. And that's why he says at the end, not, well, and you can't keep it. Instead, at the end of chapter 5, he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What? And he embodied it. Paul says that in Romans chapter 10. Christ is the end of the law for those who believe. He's the goal. You can see him as the bread of heaven, as the light of God's presence. What God intended through Moses all along. But they missed it. They missed him. The day turned to night because they missed 
that the law not only requires justice, and by the way, that's what I think of. When I think of commandment, I think judgment. Almost, you will be judged, should be the Scripture above. Not as your Father is merciful. Really? Yes, really. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, don't demand it back. And just as you want people to treat you, Treat them in the same way. Because if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good. Lend. Expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And here it is, you'll be sons of the Most High God, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful, and don't judge. See, I think the law of Moses often, and I think this is the problem that Israel had. It's what the psalmist talks about. It's what Jesus talks about over and over again. It's the problem that I have in my life, and perhaps you do too. For some reason, when we know what is right, the standard, you know, the commandments, I don't know what it is about us, but we won't spend a lot of time reflecting upon how we come short of the glory of God. Like Paul says, we all sin. We all fall short. It isn't fascinating that we don't, we're not quick to admit that, but my goodness, and I've said this before from this pulpit, it's easy for me to spot your sin. Oh, I, I, I spot that a mile away. Aren't we quick to judge the weaknesses of others? But God knew what he was doing, because the law is not just a standard of justice to do what is right. Hear me. The law is a gift of God's mercy. And the reason Jesus comes in the darkness as the light is because he embodies justice. He embodies mercy, doesn't he? I mean, think of it. Tell me when you read that, those the part of this sermon. Tell me, did he love his enemies? Tell me, did he? Did he pray for those who mistreated him? Father. Did, did, did he turn the other cheek? Did they take the very shirt off his back? Was he one to reveal the very heart of God? Is God God, not our Father, who is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Aren't you glad He's kind, He's merciful to ungrateful people? Even when you can't even see it, when you've got truth staring you in the face. Because we all know that we desperately need the mercy of God. Because if we weren't forgiven, if love didn't cover a multitude of sins, if the Lamb of God didn't come and offer the sacrifice, if the manna from heaven didn't come and offer himself as the bread to be broken, tell me, where would we be? See, we're supposed to be like our Father kind and merciful. The staff also pictures something else for me. 
There's another story about Moses and the staff. Are you familiar with it? Anybody know this story? Well, of course, that, that's, that's an interesting idea for the, he used, that's right, that's a whole other sermon. Who talked about the snake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so when he's, it's the Egyptian magicians, say that fast three times, Egyptian magician. When they're doing this contest, who can do what, and they throw the rods down as they become a snake. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. There's so many other parts of this story. But I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the rock. Because there's a second time according to Numbers 20. I mean, the children of Israel, they just, they're constantly complaining, you know. They just witness God save them from the Egyptians, and they turn and see a desert, and they go, what are we going to eat? I mean, they're just complaining immediately. I'm so thirsty. And so the second time this happens, they, they have forgotten the works of God. They've forgotten his mercy. They've forgotten what God can do. Can God prepare a table in the desert? Yes, he can. And yet they've forgotten just like we've forgotten the mercy of God. And so what does Moses do? He takes that staff, and instead of hitting the rock once, what does he do? He strikes it twice, and God says, mm -mm. He struck the rock in anger. And brothers and sisters, I hear poetry in that. Because if the staff represents the mercy of God, Oftentimes, even righteous people will offer the mercy of God with anger and with contempt. You know, the people who constantly complain, the people who constantly need something, you know, that don't keep the law, and they had, they've made their bed, and now it's time for them to lie in it. And, and, you know, we will try to show mercy to the high-maintenance the people, the sheep that always lose it away. You know, we'll try it. We'll show it. We know we're supposed to love her. We know we're supposed to show mercy. But sometimes, God, help my soul. I do it with judgment and contempt. As if somehow, you know, I've achieved. Isn't it great to help people when you're standing so firmly on your own righteousness and you reach down and say, here, let me help you out a little bit. If you wouldn't keep making the same mistake, you wouldn't find this mess. Strike the rock twice. Well, mercy comes, but do we see the promised land? Do we forget? If it weren't for the mercy of God, I wouldn't be here. And neither would you. Right? Can God prepare a table in the desert? Yes, he can. He is the bread of heaven come down offered for us so we might be, hear me, merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful. Let's pray. Help us, our Heavenly Father, to live up to this idyllic picture. It's a beautiful picture. Light shining, water in the background, a desert that has turned to paradise. The justice of God in one arm and the mercy of God in the other. That is a beautiful picture of the second Moses, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Help us, I pray, as you've revealed your merciful heart and the justice of the law in your Son, who fulfilled every commandment, kept every promise, and inspired us to be merciful as you are so that we'll be called children of God, sons of light, daughters of heaven. Forgive us for our contempt. Forgive us for the judgment. Help us to freely give as we freely receive your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a song of response. I'll be at the front to receive any who need to make a public decision. Let's sing together. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind
our time of worship and uh, it's been a good day today thank you Rodney and the sermon series as we do these windows and we pray for the next several Sundays we continue to have beautiful sunlight and uh, just as a reminder we are not having services or any activities tonight due to the possible weather and uh, along those lines many of you came prepared to give an offering we have offering boxes there many of you give online you set it up through dip bill pay but uh, many of you I saw grab an envelope this morning and you can put them in the offering boxes as you leave thank you guys y'all have a wonderful Sunday <laughs>